Okay, welcome everyone to today's webinar sponsored by the Chicago DOE Alliance Center, CDAC, here at the University of Illinois, Chicago. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Francesco Belli, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow in the CDAC partner group of Eva Zurich at SUNY Buffalo. Francesco is a computational condensed matter physicist with a special interest in the topic of hydride superconductivity, as you can see here, uh, also a topic of great interest to CDAC. And he focuses on quantum effects and anharmonicity and has done some ele elegant calculations of these phenomena in these materials, including studies of lanthanum hydride, the first uh, room temperature, near room temperature superconductor that was predicted and confirmed by CDAC. Francesco has a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Rome and a PhD, which he just received from the Materials Physics Center at Donostia San Sebastian, where he worked with Ian Arena before joining Eva's group at SUNY Buffalo just a few months ago. So over to you, Francesco. Thank you for agreeing to give this talk. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction also. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone. This talk is going mainly uh, going mainly uh, about being of about a characterization of the hydrogen-based superconduction yes. from first principle as the title says, and that means that I'm going to tell you about some specific features that are able to enhance critical temperature in this kind of materials. But then, as well as I uh, was introduced, I'll telling you a bit about this uh, introduction of the quantum behavior of your nuclei in your simulation and how this can, in a way, affect uh, the results that you would get. So, like, I think you are very familiar with the topic of superconductivity because especially in these last months has been a very hot topic in the news, but just like to break a bit the highs, I would like to give you a brief introduction of uh, what's going on. So this field is born more or less at the beginning of the 1900 when um, uh, the first superconductor, which was mercury, was discovered. And as you can see, like the critical temperature at the beginning were quite small. But of course, with time, we managed to find better and better superconductor until we had the first big um, breakthrough, the field, and that, that came with the discovery of the cuprates. So these materials are in a way some kind of ceramic, which appear to have very high critical temperature, which is above the looping point of nitrogen. But they have the downside that their superconducting mechanism is not completely understood even to this day. And uh, so this makes this material a bit hard to rely upon because you have not really the chance to predict a new, new kind of, uh, let's say, cuprates. Then later on, I think just at the beginning of this um, 2015 or so, uh, a new the, with the possibility of synthesizing other gender, um, synthesizing material at high pressure, there was the chance to create to discover this new class of superconductor, which are the hydrates. So these materials, as you can see, have an extremely high um, critical temperature, but unfortunately, this comes at the cost of the pressure, which is extremely high, about of the order of the pressure at the core of the Earth, which is necessary uh, to stabilize the, their structure. But um, so this, all that I'm going to tell you today is going to be mainly about this, uh, this class of superconductor that I think is important that I, uh, that I need to mention. So um, these materials, probably you are familiar with this, are synthesizing using this kind of methods. So. Uh, you usually have some a diamond anvil setting, which you have two diamonds that you squeeze, uh, squeeze, uh, squish one against the other, and then you put in a way inside here the main ingredient for your superconductor. And then by squeezing the diamonds, you hope that maybe inside the the cell you will form a superconductor. And um, here you can see like a, a small picture of what it looks like uh, well, inside this uh, this setup. So this as you can imagine, these experiments um, are extremely expensive and they are extremely um, uh, complicated. And also, like although these materials are being synthesized, they are synthesized in really small quantities and do also to the high pressure, they do not really have yet a real uh, applicability in the real world. But they, in a way, they have a very big uh, upside. And that is that they, uh, super, the mechanism that give rise to their superconducting properties is uh, currently understood. And that depends from uh, electron-phonon uh, interaction processes. So what does this mean? 
This means that since we understand why superconductivity arises in this compound, we have the chance to use uh, first principle simulations in order to try and uh, predict new superconductor. And that is also beneficial for experiment because if we have managed to predict a material that is fundamentally uh, a superconductor, we then can propose to experimentalists to try this material out and see if effectively they are uh, superconductors, okay? And also with first principle calculation, one maybe can try and discover new material that retain this kind of high temperature superconductivity property, but at, at the same time, maybe uh, this allows us to reduce the pressure of stability and have the best of both worlds. So uh, room pressure and uh, high temperature superconductivity. So I have mentioned it, and for this talk, I think it's a bit important that I explain to you what, what I mean when I say first principle simulations. And um, what, uh, what you try to do in this case is to try to solve your materials uh, uh, theoretically, but you do so through um, a computer. So to do so, you always start by the main ingredient of your system, and that is uh, this equation here, and that is generally your uh, Hamiltonian, which is composed by these five different terms, which are like, the, of course, the momentum of your electrons. You got your interaction between electron and nuclei. You got your electron-electron interaction, your nuclei-nuclei interaction, and also you have this um, term, which is related to the momentum of the nuclei. And what you usually try to do in this case is to separate this Hamiltonian in two different terms. One is related to, uh, to the Hamiltonian related to the electronic part. And then you factorize on the side this term, which is the kinetic uh, energy of the nuclei. Usually, when we do structure prediction, what we do is that we try to neglect neglect this quantity because you assume that it seems like the nuclei are big particle they can consider to be like still in space. Okay, And so like they do not move. And then what we do, is uh, to solve our system, we define a set of um, uh, wave functions for our electronic state. We use it to construct um, a ground state function. And in this case, since we are not solving the nuclear part of our system, we just refer to all the degree of freedom, which depends from your nuclei, which appear here and uh, here, as a parametric dependence in our state. And then we use this state to solve our Schrodinger equation associated to the electronic um, uh, problem. And we end up with defining this function here, which is the Born-Oppenheimer potential, which contain, contains inside all the information that we need in order to um, predict uh, our stability and also the superconducting properties of our materials, let's say. So why, however, are this called first principle simulation? This is because we just need the main ingredients of our system in order to be able to simulate them. So let's say, for example, we want to simulate carbon here. So that means that we just need the mass of the atom. We need the number of electron. We just are able to pick a pressure, pick a temperature. We input this information into our machine and then to solve this Hamiltonian. And then we come out with having with this uh, born oppenheimer potential. And if you go to look at the surface and you are and you look for all, and you have uh, this local minima here that are marked by these red dots, this local minima corresponds to possible structure that could be then Synthesizable in the in the real world, let's say. And um, then the last thing that I want to mention is that if you want to assess the stability of your compound, you can do so by looking at the second derivative of this uh, Born-Oppenheimer potential in respect to the position of your nuclei, and also the superconduct the core of the superconducting uh, properties depends by this uh, overlap, the integral between the overlap of this. Uh, uh, um, let's say um, atom localized wave function for your uh, electrons sandwiched with the derivative of your electronic Hamiltonian in respect to the position of the nuclei. So I want to say that first principle simulation for hydrides are an extremely powerful tool. And in this picture, you can see, I think most of the superconductor that have been predicted till I think one year and a half ago. And these are all hydrogen-based superconductors. And then you can see that first principle simulation are able to predict critical temperature, which are even higher than the room temperature. But this of, unfortunately comes at the cost of the pressure of stability, because as you can see here, like um, this is 300 gigapascal and it's quite high uh, pressure. And ironically, the one zone that we would like to be most filled is this zone here that is completely empty, that corresponds to this zone in which you have a system with low pressure, but at the same time, an high critical temperature. And this tells us that still there is some work to do. We need to try different combination and different methods in order to find new material that could potentially go fill this uh, zone. 
But in my opinion, one thing that is important to do so is to try and figure out which are the properties that are able to make of a superconductor a good superconductor. Because in this case, we are able to predict them, but we do not really have insight on what are like, the specific feature that this system needs to have in order to have an high value for the critical temperature. And so this um, is the, let's say, the background that uh, I hope uh, is enough that you need to, to figure out what this uh, work is about. And in this case, I'm showing you an analysis uh, that was done on about 180 theoretically predicted superconductors, which are all hydrogen based. And I have a binary composition. So one element is hydrogen, the other element, it is not hydrogen. And so in this case, uh, the point was to try and figure out, figure out like some kind of chemical classification, which is based on the chemical bonding properties of all this material. And also uh, we try to look at the structure and electronic features for all this compound. And it, just to try and figure out if there were some kind of simple variable that you could define in order to uh, have a good prediction for uh, the value of the critical temperature. And uh, to do this analysis, um, it's important that you understand the, what is the electron localization function. That is a theoretical tool that it was really important in order to understand like um, what I'm about to present you. So this quantity in a way measure what is the exchange uh, energy, okay, it of your- work now. What? Okay. Uh, th this function in a way is able to um, measure what is like the localization of your electron in space. And is defined by an equation like this, where um, as that has a dependence in space, and all the information about the localization depend by this quantity uh, k. And uh, this function has a value that goes between zero and one. If you have high values around one, it means that your electrons are very localized in that specific zone of your system. But then when you start to go lower at about value of 0 0.5, you go to define zones of your system where electrons behave as if they are a, a be as if they are a free electron gas. And if you go to even lower value, then you get yourself in a posi position in which um, uh, you do not have any electron in the specific zone of your system. And the one thing that this function is good at is to try and identify, um, is to identify the presence of interatomic bonding. And that's why it's useful for this kind of analysis. So these are, uh, now I'm showing to you the six, dif six different classes that we have introduced that are able to summarize what are the behaviors that appear inside these uh, hydrogen rich superconductors. So this class is related to system which have inside uh, molecular hydrogen. As you can see here, you can notice the bond. Then we have a, a class for covalent system, which is identified by the presence of covalent bond between the hydrogen and the host atom of your stoichiometry. And you can see you, ident you can identify it through the elongation of your like ELF surfaces to what is a uh, host atom. Then we have a class for um, weak hydrogen interaction in which there are weak bonds between like a cluster of hydrogen atoms or there is like networks of bonds that expands through the whole structure. Then there is a class for kind of electrolyte behaviors when electro, where electron localized in uh, like empty pocket of your, uh, in your interstitial zones in the material. And then we have a class for uh, ionic behaviors and then finally, all the system that do not seem to have any relevant bonding patterns and they behave really metallic have been put into this class that is called like isolated. So like this is somewhat of a trash uh, class in a way. So now I want to put these uh, kind of classes in, um, in, in uh, let's say, in correlation with the structural and electronic properties for these uh, compounds. So in this case here, I'm showing to you the critical temperature for superconductivity in function of the periodic group of the non-hydrogen atom of your uh, stoichiometry. And in this case, you can see clearly that like this host atom is really important in order to assess the superconductivity because either having uh, S valence orbital or having P valence orbital is beneficial for the superconductivity and has the chance of giving you an high value for the, the TC. But also you can see that the type of atom really influence the type of behavior that you have inside your system, because in this case, you have green that is related to weak hydrogen interaction. So interaction for the S orbitals, mainly 
uh, are related to hydrogen and hydrogen interaction. But when you go to on the right side, of course, as you would expect, like uh, the covalent side, so the covalent bonds between the hydrogen and the ostatum become uh, dominant. And so also the one thing that you really want to avoid is to include transition metals in your uh, stoichiometry because it seems to be really uh, um, bad for your uh, superconductive materials. Then as well, here I want to show you the critical temperature, always, but this time in function of the number of hydrogen that you put inside your material. And of course, you can see that the more hydrogen you pack, the better uh, it is. But there is also an interesting property doing this uh, classification that, has, that arises, that you can see that the weak hydrogen interactions uh, are separated from your molecular um, systems. And that tells you that if you try and break your um, molecules in your system and you try to have very elongated bonds or very dislocated uh, cluster of bonds, that seems to be able to enhance the critical temperature for the superconductor. Then I would like to show you these last two properties. One is the critical temperature in function of the shortest hydrogen-hydrogen uh, uh, distance that you have in your material. And then you can see here that having distances between 0 0.8 and about 1.55 gangstrom is the golden zone for which you can expect to have a high critical temperature. And above this, you just have this cluster of point with a low TC. But also uh, what is important to notice is uh, this pattern here, because at about 1.55, you have a set of structure, which is uh, peculiar, which has a stoichiometry one to three. So you have one ostatum and three hydrogen atoms, and they are all composed by uh, covalent bonds between the hydrogen and the um, ostatum that appear to be linear, and they repeat in the, um, like in your uh, different cells. And then finally, the last thing that I want to mention is the density of state. And this is quite something important that I want to stress out because usually in the current literature, um, they tell you that having an high density of state in your material is beneficial for the critical temperature. And that is, in, of course, uh, true. But as you can see in this case, like you have an, if you have an higher um, density of state at the Fermi level, that will increase your critical temperature, but you still have the chance to have to find um, low um, value for the superconductivity at this, uh, in this zone where you have an high density of state. And, um, and so this means that density of state alone is not enough really to assess uh, the, the, let's say, if your superconductor is a good superconductor. So these are the six um, properties that so far seems to be really important, let's say. So either having S or pre-group for your ostatum, having an high amount of hydrogen atoms in your material, either having like this weak uh, covalent bond between um, hydrogen and uh, the ostatum or two hydrogen atoms, either having uh, distances between uh, this range uh, or having like an high density of state. But as you have seen from the graph above, they, these quantities, if you try and maximize them individually, they will give you the chance of having a good superconductor, but they do not assure you that you will find one. So they serve somewhat of a required but not sufficient um, uh, condition uh, set, let's say. So, but I can tell you that you can go a bit beyond this and there is actually something that you can do to try and have a, a good observable that could tell you if a superconductor is a good superconductor. And a way to explain how you can do this, I think the best way that always works is to do it so through an example. In this case, then I am showing you this uh, yttrium H4 material. And uh, this is the unit cell. And in this case, you can see the uh, in pink, the hydrogen atoms. And these surfaces that you see around are isosurfaces of electron localization function at a value of about 0 0.9. So now what I do is to level this value of ELF and try to go sample electron, which are slightly less localized. And if I do so, you can see here that I've now captured the presence of an interatomic bond. Let's say that I plot this on the right side in order to make it more uh, clear. So the thing that you, I think you need to keep in mind is that these electrons, which are in these zones, are in a way electrons which are affected the most whenever this uh, molecular unit um, vibrate. And this is quite important, and I hope that you can keep that in mind. Because now, if I go to lower this value of LF, and in this case, I go to pick this specific value, which is 0 0.47, you can see that here I've captured additional bonds. And in this case, uh, if I plot the bonding part on the right side, you, you see that I find myself in a situation in which the atoms are all connected with a scaffold that is bridged by this zone in the interstitial site where the electrons are 
let's say, uh, localized. So this, in a way, is doing like the same thing that I've done with the bond in the middle, but in a three-dimensional scale and in a way that expands in my whole, um, in a whole cell, let's say. And if I repeat this uh, specific um, idea for all the data set that I have in my system, I come up with a prediction, which is like this. So in this case, I'm showing you, you to you the critical temperature in function of this specific value of ELF that is called the networking value. And um, as you can see here, for instance, um, you got quite some kind of trend. It is not very sharp, but still like it's like a trend that correlates in a way a bit better than the quantity that I've showed you before. This, of course, you can do nothing with it. It does not, it does not allow you to predict uh, any property. But if I put it in relationship to the thing that I've showed you before, I come up with something like this. So in this case, what we have done is always have the critical temperature, but in function of this FIDOS value, which is nothing but that networking value that I showed you before, multiplied by the fraction of hydrogen atom in your um, stoichiometry, and the cubic root of this uh, HDOS. And this HDOS is nothing but the uh, contribution of the uh, hydrogen orbital to the density of state at the Fermi level, divided by the total uh, density of state. And so this now starts to become quite good as a predictor. And uh, what I can do is in fact do a very rough fit, which is this one. And it allows me to have a prediction for the critical temperature with an accuracy of about uh, 65 Kelvin, more or less, let's say. And um, so to conclude this part, to have a bit to tell you what's going on, I just want to recap that uh, in a way I'm trying to tell you which are the good identified there for superconductivity. And in this case, having an high amount of hydrogen in your material is good. Either having S or P uh, balance orbital for your host atoms in the stoichiometry is good. Having an high density of state coming from the hydrogen atoms is good. And also having weak covalent bonds between the hydrogen atoms and the, um, uh, the hydrogen atom and other hydrogen atoms or hydrogen atoms and uh, non hydrogen atoms seems to be beneficial for like the superconductivity. And then like I'm trying to show you this predictor which uh, seems to be uh, in a way good. And, but in this case, you could argue to me that maybe having an accuracy with about 65 Kelvin error is not really so good as a predictor. And on that, I agree, but I would like to mention that this quantity starts to become useful whenever you put it into, uh, let's say, you put it in, con in conjunction with um, machine learning methods or structural prediction method, because it might not be really accurate, but you need to consider that it comes at a cost that is about 100 or like a tenth of uh, the resources that you would need to calculate exactly the accurate critical temperature for your material. And so this means that you could, in theory, use this predictor to scan through all the set of structure that you have very fast, identify just the structure that seems to be the good superconductor, and then invest your computational resources just for this specific structure, which you're, you know already will have an high, let's say, uh, critical temperature. And one last thing that I want to mention before moving on is uh, this, and that is that this networking value that I'm showing to you is uh, just like, um, an heuristic quantity, let's say. So there is no real math behind it that tells you why it is effective working, but there is a way to give it like a very rough explanation that could in a way account to, it could tell you in a bit what is really happening with this quantity. So you need to consider, as I told you before, that this quantity, the electron phonon matrix element, are the quantity that in a way, uh, is the quantity that in a way tells you how good a superconductor is. And in a way, if you have an higher G, you, will, you are expected to have an higher, uh, let's say, critical temperature. And so you see that, as I told you, this depends from the overlap between the, atom, the, wave fun the electronic wave function, which are localized on your electronic sites, sandwiched between this uh, derivative of your um, electronic uh, Hamiltonian. So the situation that you have in this equation, it's somewhat the integral of this quantity, in which you have this function which are localized on the site and this distortion which happens somewhere else. And, um, and if you want to maximize G, the, the good thing that you need to do is to maximize the overlap between these electronic wave functions. And so in theory, then you can see the similarity because in this case, 
I'm trying to capture this quantity here because I'm trying to sample zones where the electronic function, so the electronic, let's say, density and the exchange that you have overlaps the most. And I'm and I'm doing so trying to take it into account for like um, the whole size of my uh, system, let's say. So now uh, this is part is done and I want to move uh, forward going a bit backward. And I want to tell you a bit about what is what are what is the effect of this uh, quantum fluctuation that uh, you need to include into your um, calculations. Okay, so when I was telling you about this uh, born oppenheimer potential before, I told you that in theory you could discard the kinetic energy which arises from your um, uh, that arises from your nuclei because you assume them to be still in space, and then you can focus only on this. Um, let's say local minima in your, um, in your surface of the born oppenheimer uh, potential. So this usually can work when your nuclei are very heavy, but since now we are dealing with hydrogen atoms, you need to consider that the nuclei are very light. And that means that they cannot really be considered as classical particles and they need to be considered as quantum object, object. And in quantum mechanics, you cannot really have things that are still in space. And so you cannot really neglect this kinetic energy. And if you want the real accurate solution, you need to need to solve the Hamiltonian, the complete Hamiltonian, that includes both of these uh, two terms. And so what you really need to do is to solve the Schrodinger equation by defining this uh, set of uh, nuclear nuclei uh, states, let's say. And so now I want to show you with an example uh, how much this, uh, this different treatment can change the results that you, that you get. So in this case, I am showing to you, let's say a very um, uh, general defined born oppenheimer surface. So here you got like the energy in function of the displacement of your uh, nuclei. And if you do things in the classical manner, how is usually done in uh, structure prediction, you need to go look for the local minima of your uh, structure. And let's assume that in this case, your system, it is in this uh, specific zone uh, here. So then, as I mentioned before, if you want to go assess the stability of your system, you need to go look for the second derivative of your born oppenheimer potential in respect of the nuclei positions. And if this quantity is positive, it means that your system is uh, stable. So now I introduce the quantum treatment of, your, uh, of the system. And that means that I need to introduce the nuclear wave function. And that means that uh, this wave function will, have, will define an average position for your um, uh, nuclei. And in this case, and this is the accurate solution of this problem, your, um, the equilibrium position for your nuclei will be in this other um, situation, okay, in this other point. And so now, uh, so this already tells you in a way that like classical results are not always able to reproduce the real structure of the, of the system you might have under exam. But there is also another problem, which is a very big problem, is that if now that I have this different structure, I try to repeat, the same, um, let's say the same uh, method to assess the stability of the system, looking at the second derivative of this born oppenheimer potential, I found out that the second derivative is negative. And so not only classical methods in this case are not able to tell you which is the uh, real structure of your system, they are not even able to tell you if the system is stable or not. Because in this case, the classical method tells you that the system is unstable, but you know already from the quantum solution that this is indeed the real stable state of your, uh, of your system, okay? And so this is uh, the quantum treatment of your um, ionic, uh, B, of, of your ion in the system. And often is, uh, is uh, mentioned as an harmonic treatment of the system, because in this case, since you're using um, a wave function, you go to sample zone of your like uh, born oppenheimer surface, which are non-local anymore. And so by doing this, you have information also about the wider surrounding of the behavior of, of your, of your um, uh, born oppenheimer um, uh, curve, let's say. So this is what, uh, as I say, quantum fluctuations are. And how do you treat them? I think there are various methods. I think also the TDEP code is able to do something really similar to this, but I'm not really so much familiar to it. And what, it, what I know is that you can do it so with a stochastic circonsistent harmonic approximation, which is a method which has been developed by, what well, the concept of it is quite old, but the method itself has been developed by my previous uh, supervisor, Ion uh, Rea. I think that 
there is no need really to tell you all about the specific of the system, but what you need to focus on is that in this case, you, you calculate the free energy of your system by including inside all the, the complete Hamiltonian of your system, which has both the kinetic energy of the nuclei plus this uh, born oppenheimer potential. And then when you go to assess the stability of your system, instead of using your classical form, you instead go to use the second derivative of the free energy, but in respect to the average quantum position of your uh, nuclei. So just to mention these two are, are in a way different. And also this method allows you to have an estimate of the quantum pressure, which you do exactly in the same way, instead of the, having the derivative of the born oppenheimer surface, use the derivative of the free energy in respect to like a strain uh, tensor. So now I want to, I hope that you got something uh, that's still with you about the thing that I mentioned before. And I want to talk to you about three different cases in which like um, quantum fluctuation are really important, let's say. One is related to the inverse isotopic effect for the palladium hydride compound. Then we have quantum, the structural stability in the lanthanum H10. And finally, there is a very, let's say, devilish case, which is related to the lanthanum boron H8 uh, compound. And I do so in the hope that you, after the talk, are able to have in mind how much this uh, quantum effect can change the stability of your system. And uh, you can maybe uh, looking at, uh, let's say, um, at the current literature, you could have a guess of what would happen if on this normal um, calculation, you would apply these uh, extra uh, effects, let's say. So for PDH, you need to, generally speaking, you need to take into account that if for um, conventional um, superconductors, it is a valid the isotope effect. And what does it mean? That means that usually the critical temperature has a proportionality to the average mass, mass, mass of your, um, of your uh, system at a power, which is minus P, minus P, where this minus P is um, usually about, one zero point five, let's say. But for the palladium hydride system, it's not really like this. So it's a bit more complicated. So in this case, in this figure, I'm showing to you to you the critical temperature in function of the composition of your system. And you see here you have two curves. One is for like uh, palladium hydrogen, and the other one is palladium uh, deuterium. So what you would um, have normally in normal hydrate is that whenever you pass from hydrogen to deuterium, since your mass uh, is increasing, your, your critical temperature should decrease. But in this case, the opposite happens because passing from hydrogen to deuterium, your critical temperature increase, increases. And that in a way uh, shows you that for PDH, there is somewhat of an inverse isotope effect that is uh, taking place. However, when you go to structure prediction, you can see here in this case that not only I'm not able to get the right critical temperature, but also I'm not even able to capture this, the presence of this uh, isotope effect, inverse isotope effect. That is because you see going to hydrogen to tritium, like the critical temperature decreases, while I would expect it to be increasing. So the question is, what is happening? And uh, I can show it to you here, looking at the phonon spectra of my material. And this is nothing but a different way to uh, graphic this second derivative of the born oppenheimer energy in, in respect to the atomic uh, positions. So in this case, you can see, you need to focus first on the dotted lines. And in this case, this is the graph related to palladium hydrogen, the phonon spectra for palladium hydrogen. And in this case, I have the spectra for palladium uh, deuterium. And the dotted lines are related to the normal classical harmonic calculation that you would do to assess the phonon stability. And there is a big problem, as you can see here, is that uh, this quantity is negative, which means that your phonon frequencies are, are imaginary. And that means that your system isn't stable, okay? So like in theory, like first principle calculation for this material are not even able to assess the real stability of the system. Now, if you go to look to the, uh, uh, the black lines, these are related to the phonon spectra whenever I include this quantum treatment of my uh, atoms, okay? And you can see that first of all, the two calculations are completely different, but also like in the case of palladium um, deuterium, 
I, this uh, new way of trading your, um, your phone on Spectra is able to reproduce almost exactly the, the calculation, the real experiment that can assess the phone on Spectra of the material. So, and also trading the system like this also allows you to have a better um, uh, prediction for the real critical temperature of a system, but it's also able to reproduce the appearance of this like inverse isotope effect that you have for this specific uh, compound. Okay, let's say. So um, this is all for the palladium hydrogen. And I want to go on to the phase stability of the lanthanum H10. Um, so to tell you what this system is, this is a system that was first predicted in 2017 and exhibited a critical temperature of about 280 Kelvin, but it was found more or less out, although there are some different papers about this, that uh, there is no stable structure related to this uh, composition that is stable below a pressure of 230 um, gigapascal. However, uh, the year later, what has happened is that they were able to synthesize this structure in a lab, and they figured out instead that uh, this uh, lanthanum H10 compound was part of this uh, FM um, minus uh, 3M uh, symmetry group, but it was synthesized at a pressure of about 160 uh, gigapascal. And also later on, um, there have been um, reports of the superconducting uh, transition in, the, in this compound, at, and they found that the critical temperature was about 250, 260 uh, Kelvin, at a pressure of about 150 uh, gigapascal. So you can see here that there is a big problem. And that is because the computation are not really able to pinpoint which is the real pressure or stability of the system. But there is also a bit of a difference in the value of the critical temperature. But the issue do not stop here, because it's even worse. For in this case, I'm showing you the enthalpy of stability for various phases of this lanthanum H10. So experimentally, we know that this FM minus TM phase has the lowest enthalpy. However, uh, if you look at the graph, uh, computation tells us that there are different phases that have a lowest enthalpy in respect to this structure. So, um, not, not the so the like first principle calculation are, are not able to tell us the real structure and not even able to tell us the range in which the structure should be really stable. Okay. So the question now would be, if you have got something from the talk, is like, can then quantum fluctuation like fix this? And the answer is, of course, yes. And this is what you get for the lantern on which 10, whenever you try to include this uh, uh, treatment, the quantum treatment of the ions. So first of all, you get that the structure, this distorted structure, shift toward this FM minus 3M uh, phase. And that means you that like fundamentally now quantum effect can, effect can explain the lowest enthalpy associated to this uh, FM minus 3M phase. Then in this case, I'm showing you the phonon spectra for this lanthanum H10 FM minus 3M phase. And in red, you got this anharmonic quantum phonons, while in, uh, in these uh, dotted red lines and instead the classical phono that you would have for, from normal density functional theory um, calculations. And in this case, you can see that I can sustain the structure till about 130 gigapascal at least, while in the classical case, the structure will be already stable. So this means that quantum fluctuation can also explain the, the pressure range associated with uh, this compound. And finally, also like the introduction of this quantum fluctuation can get almost exactly the value for, of the critical temperature for, uh, for this uh, FM minus 3M phase, let's say. So this is to tell you that for this lanthanum H10, the introduction of this uh, treatment, the treatment of quantum fluctuation is really important. And like, um, and as it is for the system, it usually has similar effect to many other, which are many other system which are of the same category. So now I want to go to the last example, which is the lanthanum boron H8. And this is a very devilish example. So this, system as a structure which is um, like this. And it's a really important system because it is was found, it was theoretically predicted and it was found to be stable down to 40 uh, gigapascal, but having a critical temperature of 120 Kelvin. 
So this is important because let's say it goes to fill, it was one of the first compounds that went to fill this zone that was, let's say, empty. And so looking at this, if you remember what has happened for PDH and for the lanthanum H10, you will go to think that maybe by applying quantum fluctuations to the system, you could maybe extend the range of stability of the, of the material down to maybe uh, room uh, pressure and have a very nice hydrogen-based superconductor. Well, you will be wrong because what happened in this case is the exact um, opposite. So again, I'm showing you the phonon spectra for uh, the material. And in red, you have the this quantum phonon while in the dotted lines are related to the normal uh, GFT phonons. So you can see in this case that while the classical phonons are stable at a pressure of uh, uh, 58 gigapascal, the red lines instead, which are the quantum phonon, are unstable. And the stability remains till a pressure of about 81 gigapascal. So in this case, like the um, quantum effect tend to destabilize the system about 40 gigapascal before that what classical um, calculation do. And if you have a bit of interest in this, I can tell you that instability is related to the distortion and dissociation of this uh, boron uh, H8 um, unit, let's say. However, for, uh, for the system, there is like a, a bright side. And that is that quantum fluctuation, although they stabilized the system before, they also increase the value of critical temperature. So there are many lines in this graph, but you need to look at these um, uh, black lines, which are related to the classical critical temperature in function of pressure. And then you can see that this is the quantum um, critical temperature. And it has like quite a nice uh, increment, let's say. And so to recap you this system, what you have is that uh, um, quantum fluctuation tend to distort the structure leading to a dissociation uh, that stabilize the system to higher pressure, but at least they give you an higher uh, critical temperature, let's say. So um, I think I'm done, but I just want to recap all that I've told you. So I'll try to tell you about some markers which are good for high temperature superconductivity. And also I have introduced this uh, networking value which is a nice predictor based on binary hydrates that can give you a very fast prediction for um, the critical temperature. But I have to say that this has been trained on binary hydrates, so it, it seems to be all... It seems to, like maybe I should just... It seems to be... Um, sorry, I was saying that this has been um, uh, predicted on uh, binary hydrates. And so maybe it needs a bit of refinement in order to work for ternary or quaternary combination of hydrogen uh, super, based superconductors. And then in regard to quantum fluctuations for the nuclei, I hope that I convince you that these terms are really important in the treatment of your materials. And that I hope that I give you somewhat of an idea of what you could expect uh, whenever introducing this quantum fluctuation on your calculation, if you do some, or whenever you read a paper which has done only classical calculation, maybe you have an idea of what would happen if you have to include these uh, new corrections. And also want to stress out that the inclusion of this correction in the calculation is also important to achieve high critical temperatures and low uh, pressures. And that is because you either are able to sustain structure which have an high critical temperature to a lower um, pressure, or you maybe can destabilize the system at an higher pressure, but you have this increment in the TC, which you will not able to capture if you just did this uh, harmonic uh, estimate for the critical temperature. So uh, this is all. I think I have nothing else to say. I hope you understood something of it and uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Very nice talk, very clear. The talk is now open for questions, comments. Simply unmute yourself, raise your hand, or put the question in the chat. Maybe I'll start by asking about uh, this last example where uh, quantum fluctuations actually increase TC in the lanthanum borohydride. Do you have examples like that in other systems? And do you also have more or less a, a, a qualitative or a, a physical picture for why that's happening? I have to say that I was op this I was not open, but I knew this question would come and I'd made like an additional slide about it. 
and I'll tell it to you. This is it. So like there are a couple of systems that in, we had found out in the literature, okay? And I can tell you that there are two different classes of hydrogen-based superconductor, which tells you effectively which behavior you can expect. So that superconductor behaves to a class two structure, which is composed mainly by lo localized uh, molecular units. And this is a representative picture of what you would happen, what you would have between the classical, going to classical to quantum that would tell you effectively what is happening. So like you see here that in the uh, classical case, you got this born oppenheimer potential and in that system, you find, let's say to be in this specific zone here. But then when you go to the treatment of your free energy, you have that like um, your potential energy between these two, uh, these two minima gets renormalized, but also you have that your minimum of your burn up and up of your like uh, energy surface shifts. So in this case, you would have that this happened just because you have this um, renormalization of the energetic barrier within two different um, and two different like uh, uh, local minima. And that fundamentally what happened is that since you're treating your system in a quantum way, that just makes sure, make so that your system in a way is not trapped anymore into your local minima that you had like identified, let's say. Mm -hmm. And this consistently give you that if you have a situation like this, so your system is composed by a isolated molecular unit, that makes sure that your structure will always distort you have, we have most often an instability at higher pressure and you always have to expect an increment in the value of the critical temperature, let's say. I see, okay, yeah, thanks very much. Brent, I think you were next. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, it was very clear actually, but I'm not completely clear about the, what you call the SSCHA approximation. It's a self-consistent, harmonic oh, approximation uh -huh. to renormalize the phonons, but it doesn't have any imaginary part to the phonon self-energy, does it? Where you get uh, lifetime effects uh, from uh, coupling through cubic potentials, quartic parts of the potential and so on, or does it? Oh, okay. I, I, let me try to unpack your question because I'm not really sure that I understood. You say that since you trade the, your, your phonon through this method, it will not ever be able to tell you that you will have imaginary phonons. That's what you say, right? No, no. Uh, imaginary corrections to the phonon self-energy, which are like damping or uh, it reduces the lifetime of the phonons. If these are harmonic phonons, they will live forever, right? You get very yes. sharp dispersions. Mm -hmm. So... Well, Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a little concerned because even at low temperatures, you can have anharmonic couplings to the zero point from the high energy modes, and these alter uh, the thermally populated phonons as you're uh, at temperatures, even of room temperature and below. The effects are about as big as the effects from quantum fluctuations, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is a, I, I mean, looking at the quantum fluctuations, this may be a good thing to do. I'm just wondering if it's quantitative, if you're neglecting the anharmonic behavior of the photons. Um, so I can, it is a complicated question and probably I'll not be able to answer it completely. And I would advise you to check the paper, but I can try to answer to you. So first of all, um, what I can tell you is that you at least have the chance to do the same kind of calculation by adding a uh, temperature. So you could do calculation at a different temperature. And also it has been proven that in a way, this way of treating the phonons is able to capture at least the first order in the anharmonic um, uh, expansion that you would do through perturbation theory. So this not only allows you to include the presence of instability, but also like it is uh, analytically equivalent of doing perturbation theory up to the, I think, for second order. That's as much as I can tell you. That's as much as I know, let's say. But my chemistry friends use the term called anharmonic leakage, where the uh, anharmonic behaviors of higher energy modes alter the thermally populated modes uh, through like the cubic term and perturbation theory or something. Uh, 
anyway, uh, uh, I'll send you something on that too. Sure, please. I'm 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 actually okay. curious about uh, this. Okay, thanks, Brent. Uh, I think Catalan was next. Was asking about uh, the famous mu star parameter. In the okay, I'm I'm reading the question. If it's the one in chat, I'm going. Uh, yeah. Did you define the three network of superhydrate? Uh, but only consider contribution from other jadon without met. Okay, no, no, I do not have the specific picture here about it. But for instance, if you have, um, let me go back to um, this picture here. In this case, I pick a very unfortunate example. Example, I have to say, because in this case, it's only the composition is just about uh, the network that you get is just related to other gen atoms. But for instance, for this specific kind of uh, system here, you see the, the network that you create bridges the other gen atoms through the, the um, let's say the, the host atom of the stoichiometry. So like the network that you create are not only about other gen atoms, but they also relate at times with this, um, with the, with the non-hydrogen atom of the stoichiometry. And that happen for how it is often with just covalent uh, um, system, let's say. By covalent, I mean this classification that we have introduced where, these, uh, where you have like uh, covalent bonds within hydrogen and non-hydrogen. I hope that answered uh, your uh, question. Hi, this is Catherine, but I think you answered another question. Oh, okay. There was the one above on me. Exactly. That's all. Ah, sorry. My I question was about the simple, like, how do you treat the current parameter? Is it from calculated from first principles or? Uh, um, as, as in, this, in this, you mean where, when I do uh, In general, TC? when you predict TC, so you discussed how, uh, you, you know, you described the electron phonon coupling, but how about the Coulomb parameter? I'm not sure what theory you use if you use the uh, Okay, but... usually we, we do it when, when probably, what well, you're talking about, gen so I do not have any information about this. Uh, when it's about mu star, uh, we just do not solve the, um, what, for lantern H10, we actually solve all about the, um, the the electron electron interaction, but usually we just pick a mustar and we do not give a single mustar, but we tend to give like a range between 0 0.1 and 0 0.15, just to, uh, to 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 have an idea of what kind of TC you would get. Usually this does not seem to impact things so much because as you can see in this case, the, hang on, where is it? A lot of uh, slides, sorry. Yeah, where is it? Uh, like, uh, here in this case, you see like these two curves that you have are related to Mustard 0 0.1 and 0 0.15. So like you do not have this much of a variation in your TC. So I think it's, it, it kind of works, let's say. I, I see. Yeah, but I, I recently heard a talk from about self constant DFT by uh, Gross. And he mentioned at some point that, you know, for other systems, you can get a very large range of TC depending how you, you use the mu parameter. But ah, that is true. Yeah, 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 no, 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 that is true. That is true. And it is true, I think um, that I'm not totally sure it, it is uh, like, you can explain it like this, but uh, effectively, depending on how much, or you do your, your summation, summation on the, on the, even on the, when you do, when you solve Migdal Yashberg, you do your summation of the Matsubara frequency. If you're not careful, you might, you have that your uh, omega, your mustar will not allow you the calculation to converge. So like you might have a different value of the TC depending on the limit that you put on your integral. I don't know if it refers to this, but this yes, is yes. a problem. Uh, this is one technical detail, yeah. But you know, the question is, what's the impact of mu star on TC in general? Like. Uh, do we trust calculations where it's used as the parameter? Uh, or, 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 you know, so I, I assume we can, but I heard that. Kind of, yeah. I, sometimes like um, for the experience that I have, it is true that it doesn't like, it has never impacted much, but like to be careful about what we do, usually we just try to get uh, the number of Matsubara frequencies that you need to converge your. Uh, your uh, TC without having any electron electron interaction. And when we know that that is the lowest possible amount of frequency that you need, we do not increase it. We keep it as it is and we just plug in mu star because we are aware of this issue. Whether it changed too much, I do not know because um, in my case, none of it didn't seem to really be so significant, let's say.
I agree. Thanks. Well, for these systems, if you're trying to predict TC to within 20 or 30 degrees, it does make a difference because that's sort of the spread here for these materials. If for the range of, you know, say 0 0.11 to 0 0.15. Mm -hmm. so that's more or less consistent with the plot you're showing. Yeah, oh, fair enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's see, Javier, uh, do you want to ask your question? Oh, if it, I'll just read it. So, uh, was the multi-parameter criteria to predict TC derived from cluster techniques, or it was reason, or it uh, had a first principle reason to have that peculiar from from a different uh, contributions? I have no idea what a clustering technique is. I did not use any machine learning. I did it by hand, and it just seemed to work. And that is because like when I was looking about the classification, so like actually we tried to do some machine learning and try to find these variables, but at the time it didn't properly work. So it didn't give you any information that would you just notice by looking at the data. But we, we so we did it by hand. We just figured out that this would be something that worked because we have this idea about this uh, electron phonon interaction where you were capturing the interatomic bonds here. But also, you would be able to notice it when you, uh, after we had introduced this um, uh, classification, let's say, because you will see that this compound where you got these weak interactions were better, they had an IRTC. And for the system, the interaction was spread to the whole system. While instead, where you had the molecular system, where you had isolated pockets of your left or isolated, um, as in this case, the TC was low. And so like, by just looking at the classification, it started to become really clear that trying to build this network was uh, a good idea. And then it was just a matter of wasting some time to find a way to find the best definition that you um, can get, let's say. So like, this is something that came out to be arbitrary. I figured out that if you are maybe a bit more insistent on the way you define your limit instead of taking like the highest uh, uh, value, at which you have this, the highest value of VLF for which you have this uh, uh, cluster, you pick something like, okay, I want to connect all the neighboring atoms, something like this, you may get a slightly better correlation. But then like it was really hard to quantify it and make it that you do not add a bias or do you do not have ambiguous definition, let's say. So it, it was just done by it. There was no like um, um, other way we had in mind how to do it, let's say. Thank you. I well, I will try to talk uh, uh, regarding this uh, question. My main concern was the last term, the one in which you have the hydrogen density of states uh, relative to the total density of states at the Fermi level. Uh -huh. um, so you mean I'm gonna I'm gonna get there? Which uh, this? Okay. Yeah, right. It has a peculiar form when you put, uh, put this uh, T root, and I wanted to know why this uh, root uh, in the in the term that you have in the left uh, expression, mm -hmm. uh, well, in the center, in, in the last uh, term, uh, um, how you came about this particular functional form? Yeah, so like this, so the the idea when we had this correction was this. So like this would tell you the magnitude of your like um, electron on interaction between the bond. But then like it doesn't account for the multiplicity of how many of these bonds you have in the cell. To take into account the multiplicity, we'd use this HF because we figured out if you have more atoms into the cell, they are mostly hydrogen. So you would have more bonds. So it's a very rough way to say the multiplicity of your like single uh, interaction, let's say. This term was included because we figured out that when we had done this thing here, all the systems that were up here had a low density of state. And if you go to look at this uh, quantity here, you can see that there is some kind of very low activation threshold, which become a bit more clear whenever you put, you plot, um, I do not have the plot, I'm sorry. Whenever you plot this, you will see that whenever you plot uh, this quantity here, H dos, you will see that there is some kind of activation uh, threshold for the density of state in which you have very low value and then all of a sudden it starts to spike up. So, and all these 
system that were here, which had a low value of density to state, were the system that had a very high uh, networking uh, value, but that in a way they didn't have the uh, occupied electronic state to populate to populate like this uh, this state where like electron where like to increase this electron phonon interaction. If you get what I mean. So that's why we figured out that it was good to to yes. include that term because in a way this tells you okay you have the scaffolding so you have the chance to have your very strong interaction between phonon and electron but you need to have the electron that travel on the scaffolding in order to on the scaffold in order to like actually have the electron phonon interaction i let's say okay then it has some predictive value but uh, how would you uh, improve it if you had the opportunity to add something yeah, if I knew, man, I would have done it. That's <laughs> I so far I have no idea. Like, uh, I don't know. Like, I think this form could be reviewed. There is, there might be chances to improve it. I try to do because we have looked at all the quantity you can imagine of the system, like uh, the mass. We are looking at the charge on atoms. You're looking at electron negativity on everything. And I also try to do some fitting uh, using some machine learning methods. Once I knew which quantity seems to be really important to, to actually try to see if there is a better definition for the fit. But the best fit that the program spit out is always this. So like, um, so I don't know if you can actually improve it much more. It probably is, but so far I do not have a big insight on how you could do it. Also, I'm not really working on it so, so much anymore. Maybe for ternary, when where like you not only have now the hydrogen atom, which is the only, let's say, most dominant atom, but you have like maybe lithium or magnesium, this kind of magnesium um, or also boron, which are also very light. In that case, maybe the correction should be including these other quantities or try to take into account the presence of this other secondary atom in your uh, stoichiometry, let's say, and try to correct this form by having some kind of factor that tells you that you also have this other active atom at the Fermi energy. So I do not really yet know because I'm not currently working on it, let's say. Thank you very much. Also, when, when I did this thing, there was just one ternary other uh, hydrogen compound, which was uh, predicted. So there was not this data available. And actually very few uh, compounds that have been experimentally confirmed too. So this is purely on the basis of theory. <laughs> so, yes, that, that's important to mention in this. Right, right. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Urshan has a question and then Adam. Uh, thank you, Francesco, for a beautiful talk. My question was related to one of the data you have shown on the phonon dispersion measurements. Okay. I was, I was wondering how that data was taken. You mean uh, this? You asked yeah. me a very complicated question because I do not remember or like I have no idea. Okay. If, mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. I believe there are some data for palladium hydride, but it's important to point out that not even the hydrogen positions have been determined. That is true. Higher hydrides, let alone dispersion curves. We have some data on zone center frequencies from Raman, but nothing on dispersion for most of the hydrides uh, that you've presented. Yeah, it looks like neutron data, but I'm not so sure. So... Yeah, there is neutron data on palladium hydride. As I recall. Okay, Adam. Yeah. Uh, before I ask my question, I'll comment that uh, for these intermediate palladium hydrides, there actually does seem to be some sort of hydrogen sublattice reorganization around like fifty Kelvin as well uh, in the literature I've found, uh, which you know is similar to the work that uh, I'm working on right now. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that just makes it harder to find where the hydrogen are in, uh, palladium hydride. Uh, but yeah, my, my question is basically, um, does the SSCHA method have the ability to capture, say, indirectly the, uh, like say, uh, a, a prolifer, a propensity for hydrogen tunneling events? What do you mean? So uh, what I mean is maybe the specific locations of the hydrogen mm -hmm. uh, in a lattice that maybe 
you know, doesn't have all spots of the hydrogen, you know, completely filled, like there may be some vacancies or whatever. Uh, so there may be like the, the hydrogen atoms themselves might not stay in their, you know, uh, position. Oh, I see what you mean. They well, might tunnel between local minima. You can, you can, um, so like, so in the case, in the case you have your structure and you have a vacancy, you might be able to like figure out if like there is this kind of uh, tunneling. I do not know what would happen because, and these are, I've never done it. And I don't think anyone that I use this program has done it. But usually what you do is that you relax, you, you try to figure out this, but by doing this, you perform um, Monte Carlo uh, dynamic, let's say. So in theory, at each step of your dynamic, you go to up, upgrade, update your average position of your uh, nuclei. And in, in, in case you had the freedom, if you have the chance of one atom to like move somewhere else, this atom will move somewhere else, let's say. So in theory, you can perform a dynamic and you could capture or see if there is some kind of tunneling happen, let's say. Because even in the case, for instance, of lanthanum H10, um, this is in this case, for instance, no, these two structures in the classical sense have a lower um, enthalpy, but they also have a lower energy. And that means that they are in a local minimum, which is uh, which is lower in respect to the one of the FM minus 3M. But then like also this, but then they move to this and but the, the born open number surface, surface is not that it changes. So like effectively what you're capturing is the fact that your system is able to tunnel itself into some other state, let's say. Now what happened with vacancies? I do not know, but in theory you can see this happening, let's say. I hope this answered your question. Sure. So you're saying it's like uh, in theory it would be built into the SSCHA method? Yes, 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 yes indeed. Okay. But maybe another way of asking that is you don't typically map out where the the proton density is in the hydrides. That is, looking for pockets of quantum diffusion of protons throughout these local minima on the energy landscape. You don't typically do that. Do you understand the question? Uh, no. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, well, you show you show you know a, a simple. Uh, one-dimensional potential surface and you've got a, a local minimum uh -huh. uh, in your three-dimensional energy landscape you have multiple minima and in principle mm -hmm. the way you would look at you could look at the quantum tunneling is just to look for proton density throughout the the unit cell let's say yes okay yes yes i mean yeah we have that information from your code but you don't you don't typically um uh, look for that or or um... well like usually no you do not look for that but that you have it as an information indeed because at the end of the day you you know well like i have a slide on the code but i do not really want uh, to get into 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 depth in it but like what you do in the code which is an assumption by the way is that you define uh don't don't look at all the rest you define like your an, an auxiliary hamiltonian for the system which is harmonic the harmonicity of which depends from the spread of your like wave function. And so in a way, this quantity here is something that you optimize, but tells you what is like the width of your nuclear wave function. So you have this information about uh, nuclear density um, in, your, in your material once you look at it, let's say. That's right. So yeah. But yes, yes, indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, more questions? If not, thank you very much, Francesco, for a very nice talk. It's beautiful work. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all next week. There'll be a joint uh, webinar with the CMEX Center. So see you next week. See you. Bye-bye.